Hey, I'm Kyle. Welcome to this episode of the Newfoundland Hobbyist. So for today's episode, we have something that is, in my opinion, extremely exciting, and that is the topic of hand tools. So this episode right now, and the next upcoming two episodes, I think, are going to be all about hand tools, and that thrills me. As you can see here, I've got quite a fine collection, and for the past several years, it's been a big hobby, a big passion of mine, both using, collecting, um, researching, and learning the history, all about hand tools. So before we dive right in, let me first say that what I'm going to say in this video is my opinion. So it's what I've gained over the last few years and it's really how I strongly feel about these types of tools. I will also say that even though I feel very strongly about hand tools like this and their usage, I recognize it's not for everyone. You might be watching this video and you might be a home contractor. And the idea of building houses with these tools is long gone decades ago. And I would support that. Um, it'd be difficult to find a place for all of these tools solely as you're used, say, as a home contractor. But they do have many, many benefits that I think for most people make them way better than those power tools you'll be buying. So to start here on a less serious note, these tools are pretty. They're so beautiful. This is not a real serious note, but you gotta admit that there's something so classy and so classic about all these tools here. All the wood and brass and steel is just so much nicer looking than all that plastic covered stuff that you buy these days. Now, I have plastic tools, more modern power tools myself. But to me, they just can't touch the class of what you see here in front of you. Tying in with that classy, eclectic feel is another reason I think these tools are great. And I think they should be kept, restored, taken care of, is the heritage aspect of it. These are the tools that built our societies. Our towns here in Newfoundland we have now were built with tools like this. A lot of our boats were not that far removed from the time when our fishing vessels were built here in the town I'm in right now, Burlington, Newfoundland, was a shipyard. They built ships here with tools like this and tools even more crude than this. And I don't think we should just let all those tools rot and rust away. They have a large historical value, in my opinion, and we should try to maintain that and take care of them. So let's continue for a minute with that idea of tradition. And let's talk about the idea of actual hand skills. A lot of these tools these days, modern tools, let's face it, they do a lot of the work for you. Of course, it still takes a lot of skill. I would never try to discredit any builders or contractors like that. But a lot of these tools, for example, a table saw, where everything is squared and trued for you and you run your material through, it's a lot different than the skills that are required to use some of these hand saws to get your material all squared up and true. So if you've been working in carpentry for say 15 years, 20 years, or spent a career at it even more, and you've used power tools so much that you're not able to cut a square cut with a handsaw or use a plane effectively to trim something down, I think that's a little bit saddening, in my opinion. Just a little bit sad that those skills have been lost. Those real skills working with your hands with the wood, they're important and I think they should be preserved. Okay, now for you folks that couldn't care less about the historical value, the history behind it, the, the hand skills or anything like that, maybe you're just not a sentimental person at all, I have a whole bunch of practical uh, reasons for why these tools are still so excellent for so many people. The first I want to talk about is cost. For the value of all what I have here and We'll talk about what's needed for a basic hand tool skill set later, but 
everything I have here costs less than a new table saw. Okay, even and, and there's enough tools here to build almost anything. You could build an entire house with what's here. And it's less than the price of a table saw. Uh, every tool on this table here right now, I bought used. So these are antique vintage tools that I restored for myself for very little money, very little cost. And uh, you just, you don't get that with modern power tools. If you need to buy enough power tools this day and age to build a house, I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars between uh, electric planers and table saws and chop saws and compound miter saws and so much more thickness planers and etc. You're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. And this is just an investment of a few hundred bucks here to get so much stuff. Most of these hand tools you're looking at here now, you can buy modern versions of it today, which is great. They're still cheap because they're hand tools. I recommend going even cheaper and going with vintage antique stuff. Hunt around the antique shops. Lots of people around, probably your grandparents and such, have uh, old hand tools kicking around that you never noticed before. Have a look. Ask around. That's how I got a lot of these old hand tools that would have probably just rotted or rusted away otherwise and now they're sitting here getting used fairly regularly and they're beautiful pieces of history that I'm so excited to have. So continuing again with cost we can talk about space. I mean these tools take up very little space in your workshop. I keep all these tools in one little corner of this building I'm standing in right now. I have an old like uh, uh, room dresser. I keep these tools all in the drawers so I can pull them out. They're all neatly organized. You don't need a lot of space to use these tools. A table saw alone, a big contractor size table saw, will take up most of the space you see right here when you can do similar work. Now it'll take you a lot longer. You can do similar work with one of these hand saws over here. So if you want to talk about cost, you have to look at space. And to have a shop all fitted out with power tools, you're going to need a pretty big room. You can set these up in a little small room, do all kinds of stuff. Continuing with cost, you have electricity. And this is a big factor that the hand tool community considers. All these tools are used completely with manpower. So forget plugging it in, forget running up electricity costs. If you're not concerned about costs, just the factor of being independent from electricity. I'm not an apocalyptic type person, but if the case ever came where you had a significant amount of time where power was shut down, or even if you're the type of person that would like to start up a homestead and live a little more off-grid, you don't want to rely on the solar panels, these tools like this are so capable without needing any electricity. So, I mean, you can't really argue with that factor. So don't change the channel right yet because we have yet another factor relating to cost that supports the buying and use of these tools, and that is the lifespan of the tools. Honestly, m almost every tool on this bench right now is at least 50 years old, some way older than that. I don't know about your experiences, but in my experiences, in my short lifetime, I know that power tools don't generally last that long, unless you're talking about some of the big, heavy, almost commercial grade power tools built back in the day in America and such. Tools, power tools, just don't last that long. These hand planes have probably passed through a couple lifetimes now. This big number seven here will last lifetimes. I could use it for my life, my kids could use it, my grandkids can use it until they're up in years and it would still be running. You take care of it and you have tools for a lifetime. Essentially, I could use what I have here now till I died of old age without ever buying another hand tool and these would just work just as good then as they are today. And to me, that is just an amazing, amazing uh, experience, both to have tools that allow you to do that, to think that this plane, this specific one here, was used by my grandfather 
back when he was a younger man, and he's well up in years now, and he's given it to me, and now I'll probably use it for my entire life, and I'll take care of it, perhaps pass it along. If I have a son one day, it'll end up uh, being his, and that is just an amazing factor. Again, tying back to cost, you can't argue with the cost effectiveness of these tools. Another reason I absolutely support the use of hand tools and think they're fantastic is because they offer a better experience through safety. So all of these tools here, pretty much none of them require the use of a respirator or ear protection or even eye protection. Eye protection is always a good idea no matter what you're doing, but they don't really require it like the use of these power tools. There's absolutely zero risk of major injury with this plane. The, the worst thing that could happen with this is if you drop it on your foot. and it would, It's heavy enough it would probably break a toe or a couple bones in your foot, but it, you just don't have the risk. I had a grandfather who, when he was up in years, was working on a project and a, a piece of board got hooked and it hauled his hand into the table saw. And sorry for being a little bit, little bit graphic here, but it just mangled his hand and that sort of started the demise of him in his older years. These tools don't offer that kind of risk. There are accidents, you still got to be, uh, be a little careful. A chisel can cut you open pretty good, but the damage risk is just not there compared to some of these tools like a chop saw or an electric planer that can just really change your life in a split second. Something like an axe here, sure, it, uh, it can give you a pretty good cut. Found that one out the hard way, but they just don't offer the same risk. Now, that said, that makes these tools perfect for young learners, or for children, or even for adult learners just getting into tools. You're not buying a table saw and learning how to use this crazy piece of machinery uh, with all this risk attached to it. There's not a lot of forgiveness there for a tool like that. Tools like these, you can give to the youngest of learners. A spoke shave here, just a basic spoke shave, so easy you could give to a three-year-old with supervision and let them play, carve down a piece of wood, a handsaw the same thing, let them use a handsaw, even a chisel. You've got to be a little more careful with chisels because of that open blade, but it doesn't offer the same risk as power tools. So they're just so good, so safe for learners like that. So those are just a few of the basic arguments that I come up with in support of these hand tools. Like I said, I really have a passion for these tools, as you can tell, and I hope you're convinced now too that these definitely have a place for the layperson. So now what I'm going to do is strip everything off this table that is not necessary. I'm going to strip away everything that's sort of an added bonus, things you might want to look at down the road, and what I'm going to have on the table is everything you need for a basic woodworking tool kit. First off, you need to be able to draw, measure, mark, etc. So I have this combo square here. This is just a modern day cheap combo square. I really like combo squares. I think they're great. I like them better than just a standard flat steel square. Uh, they do have their limita limitations. You'll want a measuring tape too probably but you get the idea. You need to be able to measure, mark, square up materials. Your workhorses of all your woodworking projects, and this is stated by professional woodworkers all around the world, is a handsaw. A handsaw does the bulk of all your work. If you have anything to cut down, to trim down, to resize, you should be able to do it efficiently with the handsaw and then these other tools, like a hand plane, for example, is just to refine that surface. So in my opinion, you only really need one hand saw. If you're really starting, you should get a saw that's around an eight, eight and a half tooth per inch saw. So that means there's eight or eight and a half points or teeth per one inch. So that's how saws are measured. Um, an eight, eight point per inch saw will allow you to both cross cut and rip. Now I have two different saws here which we'll talk about soon but this is a cross cut saw at eight and a half point. This is just a pretty standard vintage saw and then we have a rip saw over there. 
So once we have the bulk of that material removed, you're going to want something to refine the surface. So that's where your hand planes come in. I have two here. This is just your standard number four smoothing plane. Most people have this plane probably in their garage or their shop already. Probably hasn't been used in a while. But there's a ton of these around. And the reason is that they're the most versatile size. The smoothing plane is so common because it's that middle size. It's large enough to do most bigger jobs, even plane down material like a piece of two by four. But yet it's small enough to do work on the kitchen cabinets as well. It's pretty well right in the middle. I have a little block plane here as well. This is just a little small Stanley nine and a quarter. I love this plane and I would recommend one of these two. I put these in the basic kit because to me for small projects this is where I like to go. A little block plane like this is so handy and you can do such tidy work with it. A spoke shave. I think it's a good thing to have in a basic kit. It's great for doing contours of corners and fitting handles, making any, anything round like that. A spoke shave is a great way to do that. Of course you want a hammer. I like a nice wood handled hammer. This is one I cleaned up and found. This is a vintage piece. But just a standard claw hammer to be able to drive a few nails, take out a few nails, you get the idea. The last thing I think you absolutely need is the ability to punch a hole. So if we're talking about hand tools, that means probably a brace and bit is the most common, it's the easiest to get. There are other types like uh, the small egg beater style drills or you can get those at chest mount as well, the egg beater style drills. And there are lots of different types of brace and bits as well. But just something to allow you to punch a hole. So you'll need a brace here. This is just a standard one. And then a set of bits ranging. You'll want various sizes. So I've got them from little tiny little bits to nice big one inch auger bits here. So you want a set of bits. And if you have this tool kit right here, you can do pretty much everything. Of course, I have the chisels here as well. Uh, get yourself a set of chisels. They don't need to be expensive. They don't need to be anything crazy fancy. Just a nice set of chisels that will hold an edge ranging from probably at least as low as quarter of an inch up to probably one inch. I have bigger chisels, I have smaller chisels, but those are sort of your bread and butter everyday chisels that you'll want to have. Now if you have the tools we just mentioned, the next thing I recommend you're spending money on before we talk about any specialty tools is a woodworking vice. Now most of you have a workbench. If you don't, you're going to have to build a nice little workbench for yourself. This is a standalone one, which I highly recommend. If you've got to build one onto your actual wall in your garage, that'll work as well. But you'll need a nice woodworking vise. And this is a great option. This is the Yast M7WW. A woodworking vise usually has a big, deep plate like this and the ability to mount a soft jaw on the vise. So you can see the vise is actually inset into the bench here about an inch bolts up and underneath and then you have this is a quick release one so it has a lever here that allows you to move the vise and then whatever you let go it locks and you can start threading but it's great you want a soft jawed vise because anything with a steel jaw like your standard shop vise or machinist vise is going to leave marks or dents in your wood you've probably experienced that before but a soft jaw vise like this you're clamping wood with wood try to use probably a softer wood, sort of a sacrificial piece of softer wood in your vise like this so that it will compress and it will gouge and dent before your workpiece will. Okay, now let's talk specialty tools. If you have all those basics, the next thing I'd recommend you to get is a finer tooth saw. Now this is an 18 point per inch frame back saw, so it's a very fine saw. This will let you do those nice, clean, crafty cuts. So if you're working on some cabinetry, you're doing moldings or something like that, you'll want, you'll need a finer point saw like this. And this is a great option, a frame back saw like this is nice and rigid. This is a beautiful warranted superior, not a real high end saw, but beautiful vintage steel and can be sharpened for, for generations. Now, if you have those cuts taken care of, I recommend you delving out into a few different types of planes. So, uh, we've started off with our number four. Uh, that's your most basic type you definitely want. 
and then we have a small block plane. You might have one of those already. They're pretty cheap. Next thing I would go up into is something longer, so something to help you uh, smooth out larger surfaces or joint larger boards. This is a number five Stanley. This is a jack plane. So this, this is a nice bit longer than the number four. It'll offer a little more versatility in terms of bigger projects. And then if you want to go up even further, this is a number six Stanley. This is a beautiful, beautiful plane. Um, a plane this size will allow you to joint like edges of timber. So edges of two by four, bigger material like that. You'll want a longer plane like this and that'll allow you to span the lulls and uh, to clip down those highs to give you a nice even surface. The longer your plane is, the more level, the more true your surface is going to be. If you've seen, if some of you have seen some of those old shipbuilders planes, uh, five and six feet long wooden planes, that's exactly why they needed to be that long, is to level out long boards like that. A good draw knife will never go astray. This is a beautiful sorby here that we restored on an earlier episode of the show. But a good draw knife will let you carve down handles or heavy material let you remove bulk wood really quickly. And uh, they're just handy tools. You can do some pretty fine, pretty particular work with them as well. They're just really useful tools. If you come across one of these, after you have your basic tool set, I recommend you pick one up. If you have all of those things we already mentioned over there, we can get into the real crazy stuff. And that is different types of planes. There are so many different types of hand planes. Right here we have a Stanley. This is called a router plane. Probably looks really strange to most of you. Not many of these going around. I had to hunt for a long time to get this one. So you see you just have a flat bottom with a blade that protrudes to, through the bottom. And you use these two handles in this kind of a fashion and allows you to plane down a notch, say for uh, a door hinge, for example, that might be set into the door maybe an eighth of an inch. So this would allow you to plane that down and get a perfect, perfect surface. This is great for inlays or anything like that. Comes with a few different size blades, Stanley 71 or 71 and a half. Record made them as well. You can get different sizes, but this <laughs> unnecessary for most jobs, but if you're in it for the long haul, might be a tool for you to start hunting for. If you come over to something here, this is a treasure of mine. This is a record. So it's made by the company Record, made in England. This is number 44. So this is a plow plane. And this is getting a little closer to the bread and butter type jobs. So this has a fence. And then your blades mount in here. So I've made a little leather case here a bunch of different size blades and they're just like mini hand plane irons. They mount into the plane and you can cut notches with them. Cut notches with the grain. You have a little foot here to set the depth. This moves up and down and it's really cool. It allows you to do some cool things. For example, my sliding, my sliding lid box here. So I use this plane to cut these grooves here. It does a very efficient job at it and it's just great for anything like that. You can come up with all kinds of cool stuff it can do. This again is your icing on the cake. Not needed but such a fun tool. So that is it for this episode of the Newfoundland Hobbyist. I really hope you enjoyed it. I haven't even cracked the surface of what tools are out there. Some guys have tools that just blow your mind if, if you go online and start searching up the pictures and stuff people like Paul Sellers and uh, and guys like himself just phenomenal phenomenal hand tool users and these there are a lot of guys out there even though you might not be a kind of uh, immersed in that culture if you get searching you'll find out there are there are a lot of professionals working every day that swear by these hand tools and would never use anything but these classic old hand tools. Uh, I'm much their mind. I recognize that there are some people out there that this just would not work for. But I think if you have the option, if you're just a home worker, I think this is a fantastic way to go. Hope you've enjoyed looking at them all. Uh, if you have any questions about what you see here, head over to my Facebook page. That's uh, go over to Facebook and search up Kyle Noseworthy Dash Weeder Fan. 
uh, you'll, you can contact me there, ask me any questions you like. If you're looking for more content just like this or to see some of these tools restored, check out some of my other projects, head over to youtube.com and search my name, Kyle Knowlesworthy. You'll find my channel and tons of more content just like this. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you tune in next week to see us restore another tool, something that is nowhere here on the bench. If you want to get a little bit excited, check out this video. Thanks for watching. Tune in next week to the Newfoundland Hobbyists.